earnings season, I should say. I love doing these earnings trades because it's just a real quick in and out, um, and that's been where I've been having most of my success. So uh, that's why I love the earnings. So it, it's a quick in and out, and you can uh, make some real quick money that way. And it doesn't tie up your margin for you know a month down the road. So uh, it's it's been working out really well. So hopefully you guys have been following along on those daily market commentaries and uh, being able to participate in some of that. Anyway, uh, my name is Eric Wilkinson. Some of you guys may recognize me from CNBC, Fox Business, or even the Wall Street Journal, where I've commented on everything from economic to geopolitical and market analysis. I've been trading my own money for well over 20 years now, and I'm not here to tell you that I'm going to make you rich or that I'm going to make you a millionaire, but I am here to teach you how to take control of your finances, manage your own portfolio, and most importantly, manage your own risk. There's been a lot of stuff coming out with uh, these hedge funds. Um, you know, the hedge funds have to beat the market uh, like by two times in order for you to really make any money with them. So basically, they are just uh, gouging everybody on fees. And if you figure that you take all those fees out of that and manage your own portfolio, I guarantee you guys can do just as good as they can at the end of the day. Uh, and with a lot less margin. If you go to like a financial advisor or something like that, give them a hundred thousand dollars, they're going to invest all hundred thousand dollars. If you were to manage your own portfolio, you could use that hundred thousand dollars and maybe uh, use fifty percent of that and still get the returns uh, well over and above what they were getting you. So I highly suggest anybody out there to really take control of their IRAs and stuff like that. You you can't do any worse than what they are doing. Anyway, I've traded in most markets throughout my career. From the Chicago Board of Trade, I've traded everything from stocks, financial futures, commodity futures, currencies, and options on all of those products. And in most market conditions, as you can see, this was a crazy day on the floor. Anyway, I have to go over this little disclaimer real quick. It's just saying that basically any Opinions, news, research, and analysis, or other information contained here, or any material provided by ProTrader Strategies, is only for general market commentary. It does not constitute investment advice or solicitation to buy or sell any of these securities or underlyings. The reason why we have to say that is because I can't give you a particular stock or strategy to invest in because. I don't know your guys' risk, risk parameters. I don't know what's in your portfolios. And uh, therefore, what I'm doing could actually be counterintuitive to what you're doing. So what the idea here is to teach you some different strategies that you're going to implement on your own. But you, have, you need to do that in your own way and do your own homework because it might not be appropriate for your risk parameters or your portfolio. Uh, and so remember, please remember, past performance of any trading system or methodology is not necessarily indicative of future results. I'm sure you guys have all heard that before if you watch many of these videos. Anyway, uh, this is going to be earnings trade setups. Now, this is the last in a four-part series. The other uh, couple of ones down the road, we did calls, call spreads and puts and then put spreads. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take those two and combine it together and create the iron condor. Some people get a little nervous about the iron condor because it's a four-legged beast, I guess. Uh, but the real beauty in the iron condor is, you know, you don't have to have an assumption in the market, and and it's okay to not have an assumption if you don't know which way Apple's going to go in the next 30 to 60 days. You know, nobody really does. Uh, at the end of the day, it's probably uh, uh, you know more for the analysis and stuff like that. But if you're more of a newer trader, this is a great one to start implementing. Get your feet wet. Uh, the iron condor is defined risk, so you know going into it what your uh, max loss is going to be. Uh, we're also going to be looking at the strangle, where there is unlimited uh, loss potential to the upside and or it going to zero. But uh, most stocks don't generally do that overnight. Uh, so there really is uh, a, a great way to implement a strategy in an underlying that, that you don't really have a good feel as to where it's going to go. 
Uh, I've been using deer as the example in some of the daily market commentaries. Uh, deer is coming out with the earnings next week. I don't really have a solid idea as to which direction I think deer is going to go. So this is going to work perfectly with with deer. You know, last week I was doing the one on the put uh, earnings trades and it fit great with the retailers because the retailers really got beat up and uh, were oversold for the most part and all because of Walmart CEO so that's brought the entire retail sector down and uh, and as we've seen these retailers have actually been doing pretty good across the board so those trades worked out really nicely what we're going to try and take advantage of is this collapse in volatility or what we used to call it on the floor is the volatility crush and the volatility crush happens right after a binary event when we're going into this unknown event uh, volatility gets pumped up into these premiums so uh, as people are buying protection they're buying calls or they're buying puts those premiums get pumped up and what we're trying to do by selling strategies is take advantage of that generally uh, I think I, I read somewhere at one point in time uh, volatility is overstated about 84 percent of the time so uh, I'm a probability guy and I like to try and play the probabilities uh, so I'm going to try and take advantage of that and I play the probabilities in my options chains as well you know I want to have the highest probability of success uh, I've, I've mentioned this several times in other webinars you know if you think of it as like the casino so to speak and you're sitting at the blackjack table or you're sitting at the roulette table you know that your odds are stacked against you but everybody sits there and plays these different games thinking that they're going to make that home run well that's I correlate that to the person who's buying options I like to be the house where I'm selling options to those guys because I have a lot of different things going on and increased probability of success the odds are in my favor uh, when I'm selling these strategies but again I'm not looking for that home run where uh, something is going to go to zero I'm looking for this uh, volatility collapse and theta decay and that's the other thing we're going to take advantage of we're going to take advantage of theta contraction and right before the options uh, oh I I, don't, I guess I don't have that chart on here. All right, so right before the uh, options expire, this theta contraction happens really fast. In the last seven days, it really speeds up. Uh, you lose 50% of your premium between 45 days and uh, and zero days. So, or 45 days and seven days, 50% of the premium comes out of those. And, and then in those last seven days, it really speeds up so if you think of it as like uh, uh, an arc the arc starts when the option cycle starts at about you know 90 days and it starts kind of going like this and the theta contraction starts happening about 45 days it starts doing this and then at around seven days right here it really drops off so it's kind of like that so you get about 50 percent of the premium come out between here and here and then the last seven days it just free falls and you know because it's going out of the money so uh, that's what we're going to take advantage of this area right in here uh, on these option cycles All right so like I talked about in the previous webinars we did the bullish strategy where we were uh, selling naked puts or put spreads and then we did the earlier two weeks ago we did the naked calls and the call spreads now we're going to be looking at the strangle or the iron condor now I don't like to play around with the straddle and the iron butterfly because I know that there's going to be at least some type of move uh, there's rarely a time where the the next day it, it's very close to where the at the money we're trading the, before the binary event so we're going to stay away from the straddle or the iron butterfly we're going to go to the neutral strategy of using the strangle and the iron condor some people probably could do very well with the straddle or the iron butterfly uh, but I think for newer traders the strangle which is selling a further out of the money call and a further out of the money put 
and then the iron condor is where you define that risk. The straddle is where you're selling it right at the money. And you really kind of need to, to uh, nail the number on the straddle. So we're going to be looking at the strangle. And like I mentioned earlier, the strangle is where you're going to be selling a short call and a short put. And I'm going to talk about this in more detail as to how we pick this call and how we pick this put uh, to increase our probabilities of success. And then with the, uh, um, the strangle with defined risk is the iron condor. All right, so our essentials to success on these earnings trades is picking the right strike. Now, how do you pick the right strike? Well, um, there are several different ways to do it. The first step in picking the right strike is finding what the market maker move is for this uh, particular earnings trade. Now, this is raw stores. Uh, I only picked it because um, it was a couple of days ago and there wasn't really nothing coming out today uh, for earnings for that matter. That was anything significant. But I wanted to use this as the example to show you where you can find the market maker move on toss. Now, if you aren't given the market maker move uh, on toss or on whatever platform you're using, a quick and dirty way to figure out the market maker move is uh, what we used on the floor. And you take the at the money straddle of any of the uh, underlyings that you pick in the options chain. So you find the at the money straddle and then you multiply that by 0.85 and that gives you a rough estimate as to what the market maker move is predicting. And the market maker move is just all of the players in there where they priced that at the money straddle. You multiply that by 0.85 uh, and then that gives you a rough estimate of what it is. I always round it up. So if it came out the market maker move when I did the straddle times 0.85 comes out to you know 1.75 I round that up to 2. Uh, despite the fact that I know that that uh, is probably overstated I want a little bit more wiggle room. And then a lot of times when I'm doing the naked straddle or the sorry the naked strangle for the the earnings play I'll double that. So if it was two dollars, then I will go probably out, you know, uh, three and a half, four dollars on the options chain to pick my strike, and that usually gives me about one and a half standard deviation away. Uh, and I'll go into that a little bit more detail. So this is a your regular bell curve, right? So one standard deviation uh, lies here. One lies here. Uh, add the call, I'm being asked, add call plus put times 0.85, yes, correct. Or you can just pull it up as the straddle, but yes, you add the at the money call to the at the money put and multiply that by 0.85 and that will give you, you know, very close to what, uh, you know, tosses algorithm comes out to. So uh, I'm always asked why is it 0.85? It, it was something on the floor that, you know, it was kind of funny. It was like the big joke almost. And you'd ask somebody, hey, what is the, the market maker move? Uh, or what is that 0.85? Well, everybody was saying it's a given. You know, it, it, that's, it is what it is. Take it for what it's worth. That's what everybody does. That's, that's what it is. And it really has to do with um, the square root of the number of days. And it, it's a pretty long formula. So the... 0.85 somebody came out with and it's pretty solid and you know uh, Jim you asked about adding the call plus the put you really kind of want to go to the middle market here so you know on this one it would be about what uh, 185 plus the 175 uh, ish and you would add that together times 0.85 and it should come up with something roughly close to that All right, so this is the bell curve, and what this says is basically, you know, if this is our start point, uh, you know, 34% of the time it's going, or, you know, it's 50-50 whether it'll go up or down on the bell curve, but 34% of the time if it goes up, it's going to remain in this area, and, you know, uh, 
what is that, uh, 48 percent of the time it's going to remain within two standard deviations. So what we're going to try and do in this next chart or this next bell curve gives you a little bit better idea. It's a little bit easier to picture and one standard deviation move is usually around a 16 or a 15 delta and that is on the options chain there and what that means is that you have the 16 delta that means you have about an 84 probability 84% probability of it remaining out of the money. That's, that uh, strike you pick at the 16 delta is saying that 84% of the time it's going to land somewhere down here. Okay, for the earnings trades, I like to extend it out to the 10 delta right in here, which gives me about one and a half standard deviations away. Uh, you're going to collect a little bit less money for it, but you know. At the end of the day, I like to be safe than sorry, and and you know, get my uh, singles and doubles on these types of trades. So what we, with this trade, we're going to, you know, if we don't have a market direction assumption, we're going to pick the 10 delta here, the 10 delta here, which gives us the probability of remaining out of the money of about 80% because you have to add both of those in. If you just did the 10 delta here, you have a 90% probability of remaining out of the money, uh, but if you do both of them, you have to add those two together and that gives you about 80% probability of remaining out of the money, meaning that it's going to land somewhere in here 80% of the time. Does that make sense to everybody so far? Oh, my! I see my uh, chart is coming up a little bit late. So. Um, the next step we have to make sure we pick the right duration. Now this is what I touched upon. Uh, this was the chart I was looking for uh, and this is your uh, time decay or your theta decay and what happens is you know 98 days out it starts decaying and if you've watched many of my other webinars that weren't associated to earnings trades you know I like to pick right around here 45 to 20 some 28-ish days and enter my strategies around that timing because then you get this this drop off and then I like to exit somewhere around seven days because uh, if there's nothing going on uh, the there's a lot of things that can go on inside the seven days what happens is, is gamma starts increasing and so does the deltas and uh, it just gets a little wonky so I like to be out of that uh, and out and clear from what happens in those last seven days. But for these earnings trades, because it's a binary event, you have a lot of uh, volatility pumped into those premiums, the day after, you could be even directionally wrong and still make money. This could, if I sold one and a half standard deviations away or one standard deviation away, and it came up right to my strike, and just slightly went into the money even, I could still make money because of all of that volatility coming out and the theta decay coming out of those premiums really quickly. So uh, you can still make money on those even though you've just gone into the money. Now if you go deep into the money then that's a different story. That's going to be where you need to uh, either get defensive, roll it out in time, or just rip the band-aid off and move on. Uh, and to increase your probabilities of success. If the first trade you do is a loser on an earnings trade, don't let that scare you away from other earnings trades because your probabilities will work themselves out. It's kind of like the coin flip. If you flip a coin you know, five times and it's gone heads every single time uh, and the next five you, your probabilities are that it's going to end up being 50-50, right? Everybody knows that kind of jargon. You flip it once, it goes heads, it's about a 50-50 it's going to be to the tail side every or every other time so uh, you have to work these probabilities out and if your probability of success is 80 percent of the time yes you are probably going to lose one or two times out of those uh, 10 earnings trades that you do but not always um, I, I lost probably one out of 15 this earning cycle and it wasn't even that bad it was it was more of a glitch on my computer that made me lose money on it but try to put the 
trade in before the open and I don't know what happened. Anyway, uh, moving on. Enough about my problems, right? So picking the right environment. Now, like I said, picking the right environment is around these earnings trades, you have to have high implied volatility. And we're going to show you high implied volatility and it's high implied volatility percent. And that's found down here on TOS. And as you can see right before this earnings event, the night before it was at 83%. So anything above 50 is good. And usually with earnings trades, it's going to be above 75. And that's almost a no brainer. Uh, so you need to make sure that you want the more high volatility, the better it is because the higher the implied volatility percent is, the further you can get away from the at the money. So, you know, the last thing you want to have to do on an earnings trade is, you know, pick 10, 20 cents outside of where it's at, you know, that, that wouldn't work. So uh, when the implied volatility gets pumped up, the bell curve that we were talking about actually kind of uh, flattens out. Oops, that's not a very good one. But uh, the bell curve flattens out. That could be if it was skewed. But so you know, the normal bell curve goes like that. Well, around these earnings, it's going to flatten out a little bit more. Ugh, that's just horrible. But it's going to flatten out. It's uh, think about it. It just gets squished down. So you're further from the mid. Uh, than normal. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, anybody ever seen how the bell curve? For some reason, my maybe switch. My Let's see if this works better. All right, yeah, that works better. So the uh, it's going to kind of get longer tails like that. Okay, rather than having that steep up and down. Okay, so if your mid's there, you know it's going to be like that. Okay, so that means our one standard deviation is going to be further out and our one and a half standard deviations are going to even be further. Okay, so that's what implied volatility does to the bell curve. It squishes it down for a visual. <clears throat> so we want high implied volatility percent and uh, I'll go into how you figure out the implied volatility percent also. Uh, so picking the right underlying. As we showed here, picking the right underlying, we want a lot of players in these. And we, when you get a lot of players in here, you're going to get a tighter bid ask. And the tighter the bid ask means the, the more likely it is that you're going to get in and out easier. If you have to give up 10, 15 cents to get into a trade, you're going to have to give up, you know, 10, 15 cents to get out of that trade. So that that doesn't work. I mean, that's going to be where your profits are made and lost. You know, you're, uh, you, you, the only thing you can really control going into this is your order entry. And with the wider it is, the less control you have on that uh, order entry. So, um, you know, we want a lot, like if you look at Ross, it's, it's got a lot of volume and, uh, or at least a lot of open interest. Now a red flag shows up when you see that there's no volume in here, especially one day to go on that earnings trade. There was just not a lot of people playing this. And then you can look further and see the bid ask talking, uh, you know, 25 cents, 30 cents in some regards. I mean, here it got a little tighter, 10 cents. Somebody wanted to put a trade on, but they still were 10 cents away. You know, whereas the, the apples is, and this is a $50 stock, right? So apples trading at like two or three cents because there's so many people in there. So that means you you may have to give up one or two cents rather than give up 10, 15 cents to get in and out of this trade. And the wider it is, the more likely you're going to have to lift the offer, uh, you know, to get out. You're going to have to buy the offer. And to get in, you're going to have to sell the bid. So right there, you're, you're losing 25 cents if there's no players in there, really. So that would make this not meet the criteria as far as I'm concerned. And I would not do an earnings trade on Ross stores for that matter. And I didn't do one on Ross stores. 
So our max profit, anytime you're selling these strategies, your max profit is going to be the premium you receive minus the commissions you paid. Uh, same thing with an iron condor. Your max profit is going to be the premium that you received minus those commissions. Now your max loss on the strangle is unlimited because you have unlimited upside risk when you're selling those calls that are naked. Uh, and if you're trading in an IRA or a, uh, or a, a, a retirement account, I will show you ways that you can kind of synthetically create this strangle. It will be an iron condor, but you're going to buy a really far out of the money uh, stripe further away, you know, than where you uh, sell your calls. So it's going to, you know, be five, five to twenty dollars wide. So you can synthetically get that strangle in there, or the, it, it'll perform like the strangle, so to speak. And your iron condor is your long call minus your short call minus the net premium received. So it's the distance between your defined risk and your short uh, call. And same thing on the put side. So it is the short put minus the long put minus the net premium received. Now remember, we're receiving a premium for the call spread and the put spread. So those are added together. So, you know, if it's a, uh, you know, $5 wide, you got a, collected a dollar, that dollar counts for both sides because the market can't go into the money on both of these because that can't happen, right? That is a given, it can't happen. It can't be in the money on the calls and in the money on the puts. And then our break even is going to be our short strike plus the premium received. So if we're short the 50 calls and we got 50 cents for it, when the underlying trades at $50 and 50 cents on the call side, that's your break even. And when it trades, you know, if you sold the puts at 50 and collected 50 cents, when it's trading 49.50, that's your break even. And same with the uh, the break evens the same on the iron condor as well. Your short call plus the net premium, or your short put minus the net premium. All right, let's get it. Enough of those things there. Let's get into the real nitty gritty. Now I I mentioned that I was looking at a uh, uh, deer for the earnings trades. So deer, as you can see, it, its implied volatility percent is going up. Uh, this I put this you know if you click on the uh, the gear box here you can pull up implied volatility percent uh, on the trading platform it's in there if you're on the simulator like this one I had to have them set it up for me for education purposes but you can find that in your uh, if you're on toss to do that and as you can see I I don't even care what the stock is to be quite honest I I look at what the percent is that's the first thing I'm looking at when I'm doing a strategy because that determines whether I'm going to sell it or if I'm going to buy it and if you guys watch some of the daily market commentaries you know like these are the ones where you're going to be buying strategies which I rarely do I rarely scroll up to this area but um, <clears throat> unless it's usually for protection or something like that uh, like the cues I've got you know I, I bought some uh, some put spreads in there because it, it, it's the implied volatility percent can't go much lower and if it does go much lower it's it's uh, uh, not going to go below uh, 10 for uh, I, I don't know if I've ever seen it really go below 10 but um, it, it's just not going to go much lower so uh, and if it does because it's so low already the premiums aren't really going to be affected by that but if it does go up you know if this volatility blows up and goes to you know 40 or you know 35 you know I could be directionally wrong and still make money because those premiums are going to get bought up and it is going to plop it up or pump it up um, I'm being asked where is the standard deviation on the platform uh, Phil there's not so you kind of need to know that a 16 Delta and you guys can write this down and, and that's why I had that one uh, where it was the white uh, bell curve 16 Delta is one standard deviation a one and a half standard deviation is a 
10 delta, and then a 5 delta is a uh, two standard deviation. And the reason why that is, is uh, if, if you know one standard deviation is 84%, like we talked about when I added up that whole right side of the curve, 84% minus 100 is about 16. So that's your probability of being out of the money is minus, your probability of being out of the money minus 100 is your delta, you know, and that's within 1%. One, 1 so that's the idea there. And one and a half standard deviations, a 10 delta, because that's 90% of the time, and a two standard deviation is 95% of the time, which is a five delta. Does that answer your question, Philip? Good question. Uh, but that it's kind of like a it's a memory thing, so it's not on here that I know of. I, I, I may be wrong. I mean, I don't know everything about this platform, but uh, I just know that 16 delta is one standard deviation, uh, one and a half standard deviation is a 10 delta, and a two standard deviation is a five delta. Okay. So uh, open interest. This isn't showing a ton of open interest right here. You know, it doesn't have the 4,000 like Ross does and stuff like that, but uh, this will increase next week dramatically, I'm sure, on like Monday, Tuesday, uh, going into that. It's uh, the 25th, Deer comes out with the 25th. Seed drill comes out on the 24th, but uh, seed drill is, you know, it used to be a fun stock to trade, but now that it's below, excuse me, Sorry about that. I had a tickle in my throat. Uh, you know, now that it's six dollars, there's just no premiums in these. I mean, the, here's the market maker move on C drill. It's fourteen, or is that uh, plus or minus fourteen cents? So um, that's why there's just uh, and C drills a fifty-eight percent right here. As you can see fifty-eight uh, percent or down here, but. Uh, once the stocks get below like ten dollars, it's just uh, the options don't have any premium. It's just not really worth trading anymore. But uh, seed drill used to be fun last year. Uh, anyway, so on to deer again. So deer doesn't have this market maker move. So what you can do is uh, you can go middle market here on this, and it's a little wider because it's after the close and it's especially on a Friday, it's just not, the bid ask isn't there. Uh, earlier today when I was looking at it, getting prepared for this, it was about six cents wide, which is pretty good for a $75 stock. Uh, I usually draw the line at 15 cents, uh, especially if it's under $100, you know, uh, price line is a lot wider, but price line, <clears throat> excuse me, you can go middle market on price line, even though it's like, you know, uh, 60, 70 cents wide. If you go middle market any time, you can almost be sure to get filled in there because there's always people in there uh, doing it. And the reason why you want that tight bid ask is when the going gets rough, especially even when you're doing trades for longer duration, you know, when CMG, you know, world's most expensive burrito came out today and uh, had E. coli dropped seventy-five dollars. I mean, that was just a bloodbath in there. There was still a tight bid ask, so you know you want to make sure uh, that you're in something where there's a lot of players because on a six hundred dollars stock, you know you don't want to have to give up like three or four dollars to get out of something. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Whereas CMG, I think it was still, you know, uh, a couple of dollars or you know like a dollar fifty wide, even when it was like going crazy. Uh, why not do earnings play at the 80% delta? You know, I I like to just make sure that I'm outside of it. Uh, on the 80 delta, you're talking about uh, you're inside of one standard deviation move, and usually this market maker move is predicting about one standard deviation move. So I just like to go outside of it. Um, if I'm a little more confident on what I think that their earnings are going to be then I, I will pick that one standard deviation, which is about the 15 delta. But um, it, if you're at the 80%, uh, uh, oh, sorry, why do you, why not do earnings plays on the 
80 percent IV. Uh, I, I do on the IV percent, I will do anything above 50, I'll do an earnings play on it. If it's in the 30s, which it almost never is, then uh, I wouldn't do it. And I, I don't sell strategies as a hard line uh, with anything less than a 50 percent uh, IV rank or IV percent. And the reason why is because you know, if you get below that, it, the probabilities start happening where the it can increase and that can really hurt you. Just even 10% increase in the uh, IV percent can can hurt you. Uh, now I have been bending the rules a little bit on on my IV percent because um, if you look at uh, so this isn't a good example. This is on a week anyway. Um, <clears throat> but if you remember back here on, on the uh, 24th of August, we got a huge spike and that has been messing up a lot of the IV percents because uh, the way you come up with the IV percent, just so we can get the, this is calculated by uh, TOS, is where it is trading now, uh, that's not, where it's trading now, which is 38 minus where the low is, so you kind of draw a line there, and where the low is is 16, and that's on the numerator, which is the top of the uh, fraction, and then on the lower side of the fraction in the denominator, you take the high minus the low, and that gives you that 78.9%. Uh, okay. Um, uh, did I answer your question on the IV percent? I will do earnings trades, selling strategies above 50 and 84 or 80.14 would work. Um, okay, so that's how you figure out what that number is, uh, that IV percent is where it's trading now minus the low on the numerator and then the high minus the low on the denominator and then uh, that's how you get that percent. Now. Uh, so, an ex better example, I think, is uh, just for for this purpose. Okay, so this at one point was the outlier. Uh, you know, now it it's kind of bumped up there and traded that. But uh, I have been known if there is a huge spike that is just out of the blue, like what was happening in that uh, August twenty fourth area, as you can see. Uh, XRT never really got above that, and then that was a huge outlier, and then it kind of came back off and came became normalized again. So that would be a time where I would have uh, really kind of taken that out of the picture, but it's kind of done it again. So that means that it needs to be respected. But if you have that in underlying where it's just got one huge spike and then it's kind of gone back down, that is a time where I will do my own math because it might be saying that it's uh, implied, implied volatility percent of about you know 40 when it's really about 55 or 60. So that's where uh, knowing that math and being able to do that rather quickly uh, kind of helps. It, it really puts it into perspective. <clears throat> Excuse me. So. Um, Sorry, I keep going back to Deer, but Deer is one of the few ones that has earnings coming up. We have FedEx coming up and uh, H&R Block, but that's in December. So next week, really, the only ones that that I would consider are C Drill. And now that it's below ten dollars, I don't think I'm going to even do that. So as this winds down, Deer is the one that's going to probably be the one that fits the book. So when we get that market maker move, what we could do is just take this. Um, you can also go to this uh, mark, and it tells you it's about 13. Or you could, just to make life easy, let's go to the. Um, <clears throat> so we want to go to the uh, straddle, and this this is trading at $75.50, right? So we have 50 cent strikes, so we can pick the uh, at the money straddle mid price is $4.20, and I don't have my calculator up. But if you do four dollars and twenty cents, you're probably going to get about a dollar seventy, dollar eighty, 
just off the top of my head, doing it in my head. Let me pull it up on my phone, see if I can. I meant to pull this calculator up when I did it. So uh, it's $4.00. Oh no, that's not right. I wasn't wrong. I was going off at two dollars. Four dollars and twenty cents times 0.85. So we're getting three dollars and fifty-seven cent move. So that is the market maker move. They're predicting three dollars and fifty-seven cents. I would probably round that up to four dollars uh, <clears throat> to look to start looking. And uh, Delta, so four dollars a four dollars and fifty cents away, or four dollars away would put us at uh, seventy nine dollars and fifty cents. So uh, it's the twenty three. I and if you double it and go eight dollars, which is what I do a lot of times, go eight dollars out and at uh, eighty uh, three. So if you go out to the eighty three, you're looking right there. Eighty two and a half is probably where I'd pick it just to get that ten delta. That's uh, your one and a half standard deviations away. I would like to try and get about 30 cents generally. Uh, so you know, I would. That's how I play around with it. I look at the 10 delta, try to get 30 cents for that, and then that's where I'm going to do it. Uh, which gives me the one standard deviation move, ironically here, uh, and the expected move, like I said, is three dollars and fifty cents. So it gives you a little wiggle room. Uh, at one standard deviation move, and this is probably going to pump up again, like I said, going into this earnings next week on Monday. One key that I forgot to mention earlier with these earnings trades, don't enter this like two or three days beforehand because that's what's going to throw off your probabilities. Because you know, it had a 50 cent move today, it could have a 50 cent move on Monday, you know, before you get to the uh, Tuesday that you are going to enter this trade because it comes out on the 25th in the morning. So always enter your earnings trades in the last half of the day. So after after you know two two three hours before I want no one to say afternoon because some people might be on the east coast or the west coast, but uh, versus the west coast. But you know about three hours to the close of the open market operations. So that's when I look to do it and you know the best is uh, like the last hour because that's going to give you the right probabilities because the market's not going to move much past that time. And the market maker move is plus or minus you guys so that means it's predicting a plus or minus three dollars and sixty cent move. So it could go up or down three dollars and sixty cents. So with this trade I would be looking at Trying to collect 30 cents on the call side and the put side, which would, you know, the puts are pumped up because there's put skew and means you can get further away from where it's at. Uh, <clears throat> like here, we're almost, uh, you know, at a 10 delta and we're well away from this area. The reason why that happens, you get this put skew, is people buy puts more often for protection and then they sell calls against their stock for you know lowering basis and stuff so that's where you get that put skew so uh, the puts you can usually get a little further away and a little more wiggle room than you can on the calls okay uh, so I would try and get 30 cents for the calls 30 cents for the puts and then if you're in an IRA and you don't want to only collect like 10 cents on each side for you know a 50 cent wide uh, uh, strategy, which what I do is in the IRAs, I go to the first strike that is going to give me, uh, you know, that I can pay only five cents for it. So uh, as you can see, you know, you're getting like over ten dollars away. Uh, it's not a lot of protection, but it, it it makes it suitable for an IRA, and that's how you can create that type of uh, uh, strategy in your IRA and get around the rules, I guess, if you will. You aren't really limiting your risk at all because, as you can see, this is a one delta. That means 90 percent of the time it's not going to go there. So, uh, 
and that would be a massive move for target or for deer to move twenty dollars in a day. I don't know if, when the last time that might have ever even happened, other than on an earnings. <clears throat> on, on this last earnings, it did get hit. So, uh, but that was still from ninety nine to uh, eighty five, so fifteen dollar move. But I think that that was uh, pumped up in there also. Um, so, you know, that would have been one, if you had a strangle on there, you would have been, you know, uh, having that stock put to you or, you know, you're just going to have to rip the Band-Aid off on that one. I'm sorry, you guys, I have a, the worst tickle in my throat right now. Uh, why you select so far away for the protection? <clears throat> uh, because I want to be able to try and collect as much money for that premium. It's just a, a way to get, you know, it... And that depends on your risk, you know, your risk tolerance. If you don't have a very high tolerance for risk, you know, I probably have a higher tolerance for risk than most people, but if you have a high tolerance for risk and you want to create a strangle in an IRA that uh, simulates what it would in an, uh, a, you know, in an IRA, if you want to simulate the strangle in an IRA, you have to buy protection. So the way to do that is to go out and buy the first one you can get for a nickel. And that doesn't mean that you can't try and pay a nickel in here somewhere, you know, and see if you get it and then eventually, you know, roll it further out to get that nickel. Does that make sense, George? Uh, if you don't have a very high tolerance for risk, then I would uh, pick something a little bit closer. But you're going to be doing this for... Uh, a lot less money, so you have to take that into consideration. Uh, so you might have to go closer and do this, uh, you know, 16 delta ish, and the one standard deviation way, making sure that you're outside the market maker move. Now, a lot of people will even go and take this uh, three dollars and fifty cents, and and that's the hard line, you know, because it's they know it's overstated. So three dollars and fifty cents would put you at uh, $72, so right there, and then buy your protection, so you could get this on for you know 25 cents here, uh, which is pretty good for the the uh, for a 50 cent. Why? What is that? Is that 25 cents? If I sold a dollar, let's say I sold a dollar and bought the 90, it's closer to 10, 15 cents, which is still right in line. You know, a third the width of this. If you can get a third the width of what you're strategy is that's pretty good and on earnings trades it's usually about 25 percent the width so don't go less than that don't go 10 percent because then your risk reward is not going to be there okay so that's that's another uh rule is uh, it's not really a rule but that's what i look for you get about 25 percent the width of these strikes so a dollar wide i would try and get a quarter and on a 50 cent wide i would be trying to get about 10 15 or excuse me <clears throat> try to get about 10 15 cents for it so uh, now this is the important thing why why we pick the high implied volatility right I was talking about this quite a bit so if you go to theoretical and you can figure this out on your own we figured we figured the three dollars and fifty cent move right so uh, that puts us right at the 72 puts so the 72 puts, let's just say uh, on, uh, we're going to just make it so it's tomorrow. So tomorrow is that meeting. We're going to look to put this trade on today. Tomorrow is an earnings event. This is just hypothetical right now. And we do get a $3.50 move. Okay, so you can pump, push that in there. So the price adjusted by negative $3.50. Now, we know that after this event, it goes from 78, it's probably going to drop to at least 50. I mean, anytime after the earnings, uh, I can show you on, on uh, <clears throat> let's see, uh, GMCR was the most recent one that I can think of off the top of my head. This is what happens. After that earnings announcement, boom, you get that sharp, you can see it, every earnings, boom, you get that volatility crush that I'm talking about. So GMCR went from 95 to 46, all right? So that's a pretty massive uh, volatility crush after that binary event. So 
you know, having said that, if deer, which is only at 78, but it'll probably be up in the 80s or 90s right before this, it's going to get pumped up a little bit. But going back to this, we got it adjusted by $3.50. But now, uh, as you can see, the 72s would be uh, worth $2, you know, if we were wrong, right? But we know that we're going to get some uh, volatility come out of this. So what if it comes out 30%? 30% it comes out to 70 you did this strategy sold it for 90 some cents or whatever and it is pegged right there on your move you still got a scratch you were directionally wrong but because of that volatility crush you're able to escape with uh, well this is saying the market is 93 cents and then it comes out we're directionally wrong boom it comes to our strike on the market maker move, we still made a couple pennies, enough to cover our commissions anyway. And that's if you get that volatility adjustment of 30%. But as you can see in GCI, that is not unrealistic to have it go from uh, 80 to 50 or 90. You know, that other one was 40. So let's say it comes out, you know, comes out and drops by 40. You know, then that 72 strike. You made 50 cents on it. So, you know, the people with the higher tolerance for risk can uh, get a little bit closer and, and go right at the market maker move. And uh, I, I've done that and uh, I still do that. I don't do it very often, but uh, I'd much rather go out here and do the, uh, because as you can see, if, if once you start going deeper in the money by like a dollar, so you're going to be losing five cents there. So uh, I like to have uh, more winners. So I usually pick that thirty, thirty dollar or thirty cents, try and collect about thirty cents, and look, it goes to a penny. I mean, and you're at one and a half standard deviation. So it just is like you're uh, you're constantly collecting money on those. Whereas this, you can collect more. I mean, you can collect fifty cents here. Uh, when you're wrong, but I'd rather collect the 30 cents and, and uh, never have to worry about it because it can move outside of that and uh, outside of that move. So I just like to uh, generally start looking at that uh, 10 delta and then roll it up from there. You know, I, I, and if I'm pretty confident I'm directionally right on those, then I will go to just outside of that. Uh, market maker move. So if I was predicting three dollars and fifty cents, I would have probably been doing the seventy one fifty or the seventy one dollars. I always like to stay outside of it. It's just a a thing I do. But a lot of people go right with that market maker move, and they're just knowing that the probabilities of it being overstated are there, and take advantage of that too. So you can do that as well. Does that make sense for everybody? So far, does anybody have any earnings trades that I might have missed? Because uh, I know it's pretty thin, and uh, C drill and Deer were the only ones I found in H and R Block down the road. But because I don't have a market assumption on uh, on Deer, um, you know, Caterpillar, I'm pretty bearish on just because they are more in mining uh, in China and and overseas. Whereas uh, deer is more into lumber in like Canada and, uh, and and the Americas for the most part. They are a little bit overseas, but uh, Caterpillar, uh, a big chunk of their uh, money comes from uh, China. So I would be bearish on uh, Caterpillar and bullish on deer because I think a lot of farmers are, are doing pretty good with uh, their crops this year and farmers love to buy toys. Uh, ever met a farmer he's got more toys than you <laughs> pretty much guaranteed uh, what do you buy protection on the call on the put uh, for the call on the put I usually go in the IRAs to the the five cent first one I can pay five cents for uh, otherwise I look at it as the width of the strike and I need to probably get about 25% uh, width of that strike so on a dollar wide I would I would be looking to get uh, 25 cents on that but that makes you push up closer to 
um, uh, the uh, market maker move. So as you can see here, that's uh, probably not going to get you 25 cents. Usually, you won't. You'd have to work it, you know. At, and uh, that's why I kind of like to go out here a little further out and take a little more risk by pushing my uh, buy out further. So I like to play up in here outside the 16 delta, outside the 16 deltas for the most part on the put and the call side. Does that make sense, Jim? If you're in an IRA and you have, and it, it all depends on your risk tolerance. That's you know goes back to me saying you know I can't really tell you what you do. I mean it's it's not hard lined on that. This is what I would do. I, I like to go in in the IRAs or in the retirement accounts and buy that first one just to make sure that I can simulate that that strangle for the iron condors. Uh, you know, and if I have an assumption. Whereas with the iron condors, I really don't have an assumption per se. So uh, I go outside the market maker move and try and get 25%. You know, you can fit around with that a little bit, but um, you know, you got to start thinking the more or the less you gain, the uh, the more you're risking in a sense. So. Uh, 25% on a $2.50 uh, or a $5, yes, even on those for sure. You know, when it when I'm trying to simulate the strangle, that, that's out the window, right, because uh, I'm, in a sense, picking a $20 wide strategy and collecting $0.30 cents for it, you know, or $0.25 cents for it, so that's out the window there. But when I'm uh, doing a true iron condor where you're picking, you know, you know, outside of five dollars or something like that, uh, and you're picking right at the market maker move. That's what I'm looking at. If you're going for the market maker move and picking a two dollar and fifty cent, five dollar wide, you're trying to get about a, qu a quarter of the width of this strike. But on the iron condor where you're picking the ten deltas, then you're uh, looking to just buy the first one you can get for a nickel just to make it uh, appropriate for that um, account. It's just a little loophole, right, that you can kind of take advantage of. And you can do that on any strategies as well. You know, if you're doing um, a straddle in your IRA or whatever and you just go to the first one you can pay a nickel for, it, that makes it appropriate. You haven't decreased your risk, you have to remember, because the likelihood of it moving fifty dollars sometimes on a you know on a fifty dollar stock is not there. Yes, again, this is being recorded, and uh, if you were late, it is being recorded. And I always say uh, watch this again because there's a lot to go over, and it'll really make it sink in the second time. Because a lot of times you guys have questions and uh, and. Uh, they get answered that way, or or you may have missed something, and you'll pick it up the second time, and it'll make it sink in. Does that make sense for everybody? So these these trades, the way I've been doing it is picking that 10, uh, 16 delta, and doing the straddle and the strangle, and then um, they've been working out really good. So uh, you know, uh, it's rare that it goes outside of that market maker move, although. A lot of them have been, uh, you know, testing that market maker move more often this earnings cycle. So I've been really happy that uh, I've been going out to that 10 delta, and it usually is right around double the market maker move, and you know, have not been tested on those. So it's nice. Uh, that they will. Uh, it's. Philip, uh, it's in there. It will be sent to you in an email for the uh, for your uh, as soon as we can get it converted and everything. Um, I'm gonna have to. Sorry, I saw a question come up here, and I'm gonna have to read it though. Uh, so, so one to one, custom deer weeklies, November four, uh, fifteen. 
81.69.5 call for 92 cent limit. If you were to analyze this trade, it does show on the bell curve. Yes, and you can go to the analyze tab and uh, and click on the uh, one standard deviation also, and it'll show you where one standard deviation move is. Uh, that's also a way to, to do it. Thank you, Philip. Yeah, you can go into the analyze tab and you can click on one standard deviation move. I forgot about that. Uh, it will show you that. Great point, Phil. Thank you. Uh, moving beyond the market maker move, last earnings. Yeah, uh, and I traded Google also during the last earnings, and I I went double the market. Those big ones like Priceline, Google, I always double the market maker move on that, and uh, I, I was all right on it. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, so that's one of those ones where you can really get hurt on on the big ones. And with Google and Priceline, I'm always going to define that risk because those are the real high flyers. So, and and I'm not going to be picking the one that's the nickel either. It's going to be I'm going to be looking to try and create that strategy where I'm getting. Uh, you know, 25% uh, the width of the strike. And I can't remember exactly what, I could look at my notes, what I ended up doing on that. But uh, I did trade it and went double the market maker move. Do you know what, what day was that? Do you know what day that was for the Google? I can tell you exactly what I did. Um, and that's another thing, you guys. Keep uh, track of all your trades. I, I do it on paper. I'm kind of old school. Um, and just so I can go back and uh, keep track of everything. Uh, um, I don't know where it's at, but uh, I know I'm pretty sure I went up double the market maker move on that. October 22nd. Um, what did I do on that? Maybe I did October. Sorry, everybody. Why is that not in here? 22nd. Oh, I might not have done Google on. I don't. I know I did Priceline. I didn't do Google. What was the move on that? Uh, so, do you know what the market maker move was on that? They crushed earnings, didn't they? So it was fifty-two to so yeah, fifty dollar move. That was probably double the market maker move on that, wasn't it? The market maker move is fifty dollars, Jim. Is that what you're saying? So that was right pretty close if you went 53 to where it opened up. And that's the other thing with these earnings trades, you guys, um, oh, because it opened up way higher and came off, you're right. Uh, and that's that was unfortunate. I mean, it did go to the market maker move by the end of the day, but that's another thing with these is I cover these in the first 15 minutes to a half an hour, and on that I uh, probably would have gotten hurt, but if you went to because that was about a $80 move right off the open. But uh, if the market maker move was $50 and you were at $100, you would have been fine because it almost never does the double the market maker move. And maybe that's something to look at, Jim, is, uh, is, is going double the market maker move because even though you got a little bit of volatility uh, crush on there, that probably wasn't enough to cover that extra thirty dollars that it went through. All right. All right. Well, guys, we've been doing a uh, November special Thanksgiving thanking you guys, uh, and that's all I got for you guys today. Other than you can go to ProTraderStrategies.com and get this one month trial for. Uh, it's seven bucks, pretty cheap. Uh, did you list stocks in uh, volatility? 
I get different numbers than on your screen. Um, sorry, what was it? I'm going to have to expand this. Do you list stocks in standard implied volatility? Get different numbers than on your screen, implied volatility. <clears throat> Are you talking down here, Aaron? Uh, I, I don't have any different inputs. I don't. I don't know why I, it would be different. Are you, are you talking about on this side here the implied volatility? That's just what Toss does. <clears throat> on the left of the screen here, um, you know what? I I just recently copied this over there. They gave me this information, but uh, I think it should be about the same. If I go to Google. Oops, sorry. 14%. Uh, oh, why is it? Yeah, I don't know why. 44, 44.33. You know, it runs it out to the uh, to the hundredths on there. That if that's what we're talking about. Okay, um, so hey guys, uh, you know we got the one month trial here, which is you get the daily market commentaries where I talk about everything that I'm doing every day. You know, I had a little bit longer one today where I was, uh, you know, because it was expiration and I had some things that were coming off. Um, and I talk about the good and the bad, what what what's working for me, what's not, and when they're not working for me, how I I'm defending that. So um, those are those are good for you know the daily. Uh, videos. I mean, it's about a 10 minute long, less than 10 minutes long, and I go through why I put this trade on, what I saw there, and uh, and exactly when I get out. So uh, you also get access to the trading lesson videos, which are like 15 minute longs, where I go into these different strategies, but it's on a, a, a quicker, more concise basis. I go into more detail in these uh, trading workshops. So I try and walk you through the math and uh, and you also go I try and get as much back and forth with you guys as I can I get a lot out of it too and I, you know if you guys have questions somebody else is looking at the same thing just like Aaron or sorry Eric uh, <clears throat> you know somebody was probably looking at that implied volatility percent differently because it was it was rounded um, but the one on the side there uh, will give you the uh, to the hundredths and I highly suggest you guys pull that up like I had on that sidebar, on that uh, sidebar there. You can go into the gearbox and just type in uh, percent IV and it will uh, populate that for you. And that's more important to me than even where it's trading or even what stock it is. I mean, I just go scroll down that and look for the uh, what, what the implied volatility is and then I go to see if there's been any volume and open interest in there and I don't even care what the stock is to be quite honest as long as everything else sets up you know and I don't even have a market assumption on something you know I'm going to look to put a trade on in there as this is part four uh, or parts one and three recorded parts one through three are recorded now part one is we did the puts the calls and the uh, and the strangle all in one and I just felt like I didn't give it enough justice where I went in there was a lot of questions with those so uh, you know this then we went into the details on the puts the calls and then the condor on these so I just felt that I, I really uh, blew through those uh, I don't think that Simon I don't think they're available on YouTube no you have to go to protraderstrategies.com and get those um, so and that's going to be this this offer there and you guys can get a link or you guys should see a link to this offer in your chat boxes there that you can easily click on and uh, and follow that link to get that set up so uh, thank you very much uh, for the compliments you guys appreciate it Jim thank you uh, so yeah, check that out, you guys. That's a bargain basement for Thanksgiving kind of thing. And uh, I want to thank you guys all later 
videos, we're going to be drilling down on options components, how we trade them, where I find them appropriate, and how to put those on. Uh, like I said, this link is in that chat box, so you can easily go there. Just want to thank you guys for watching. If you ever have any questions, you can contact us at 310-598-6677 or email us at trading at protraderstrategies.com. You guys, I mean, people have asked me questions on things that I haven't covered in the uh, webinars and stuff like that. I love to hear that kind of feedback. It gives us ideas as to what other future videos we can uh, showcase for you or drill down on because um, there's a lot of stuff out there that uh, you guys might have questions that I may have just overlooked. So uh, I appreciate all the feedback. I'm good about answering emails. So, uh, you know, feel free to reach out if you have any questions and, uh, and or, you know, have something like GMCR going against you today and how you would try and manage something like that if it, it really started to uh, make you nervous. So um, I do that for everybody that's in these classes. So uh, I don't want to see anybody lose money. So feel free to reach out to me and uh, ask me what I would do, and I'll do my best to get you guys the answers. All right, that's all I got for you guys today. You guys all have a happy turkey day and great weekend ahead. Uh, so thanks for watching, you guys. I appreciate it. If you can't take that, take it easy. <laughs>